Oh dear, what is going on out there? When it comes to smart cities, um, it seems to be a, a very um, exciting cow is going on out there. And I would love us to talk through that exciting cow over the next uh, uh, minutes. Now, we have two avenues of doing that. So uh, I could, I could do the politically correct one and you will hear exactly the same thing as you've heard all your life about smart TV before. Or, um, we choose the exciting road, and I tell you actually what I think about smart cities uh, in the future. Uh, so which one is it going to be? Uh, uh, if you want to have the, the second one, the more exciting one, then maybe um, could you please uh, uh, kiss your neighbor? <laughs> Uh, we're gonna do, are, are you ready for that? Are you sure? Yeah. If you have any drinks left, <laughs> I thought someone would it like that. I gave you that opportunity, so don't complain. Yeah. Um, next opportunity will be probably 1 o'clock in the morning, so here you go. Uh, right, so um, let's get it going. So I'll tell you really what I think about it. Let's start easy uh, on the whole thing. And uh, you know, I just looked it up actually. There are about 4,000 cities out there with more than 100,000 citizens on this planet, of uh, which probably almost none of them would uh, feature as a smart city, truly speaking. Yet, when you Google the term smart city, you're getting 40 million hits. 40 million, do you understand that? There, there, there are like 4,000 cities and 40 million hits on Google. So there are more PowerPoints out there. You should see two more today. There are more PowerPoints out there on smart cities than there are actually smart cities, right? So, you know, the intellectual, the intellectual capacity seems to supersede the operational capability. Um, why do we need all that, right? So I think it's a, it's a good, good question to ask in the year 2017. And uh, it's not the worst of it all, actually. You know, if you look at what we do with smart cities or what we're trying to do with the data, right? The data, just heard it. Data is the, is the new oil. And um, yeah, look at companies like Facebook. Everybody uses Facebook now. So I read the other day that uh, Facebook, when you start liking something like 10 times, yeah, they know you as well as an acquaintance of yours, right? When you start liking something 50 times, Facebook knows you as well as a family member, right? Now, when you start liking things 500 times, they, I don't remember now, was it, it could be they start to know you as well as yourself or your husband or wife, I don't know, so let me see. So I think it was yourself, no, your husband or wife, 500 times, 1,000 times like, it's better than yourself. 2,000, better than your lover. 5,000, better than your shrink, right? This is crazy. And we've been like clicking like crazy for the last years about uh, on Facebook. So here you go. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg, I'm afraid, knows you better than anybody else on this planet. So here you go. This is not the worst of this, actually. I have another example. I've been asked about this quite often, I have to say. And uh, it was featured in Wired. Uh, the other day, uh, actually it was quite a while back, and maybe you've read about this because it comes out of your domain. So, uh, the Wired article said uh, that uh, when you take uh, data a, from a credit card company, uh, the name of which I cannot mention in this room here, okay, uh, they are able to predict divorce with a 70% probability. Hello, 70%. Because they know there's something dodgy going on. You start to use hotels, buying flowers and presents you haven't been doing before. That's crazy. When I read this, you know what I did? I, I, I changed from my black Lisa <coughs> card to, to the golden master. <laughs> And just to be on the safe side, I changed it for my wife as well, so... <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, so, it's, it's, it's turning out that, uh, you know, there's a quite a few... Uh, you, you're, of course, you're not doing this, and um, uh, 
Uh, quite a few myths really here in hyper ranked smart cities and you know what, let's talk this through. I want to talk about what the problems are, I want to talk about what the uh, opportunities are and then a little bit what your role is in the whole ecosystem if I may. And then we go off to drink. Shall we do that? Good, let's go, let's rock and roll. Let's start the first slide. So, problem number one, and you will agree with me about this, is that we have a huge divide. Um, we don't have smart cities, we have smart versus city, right? And anybody who has been trying to deploy something here, or use or sell something in the cities, they will know it. We've got the smart guys, um, the Cisco's, the IBM's, and we've got the, uh, the city guys, uh, you know, the Swarco's, the uh, uh, Vancees, and all these companies, which probably you've never heard of, uh, of unless you've watched this slide which Sapan has shown before, right? Because you're partnering with them. And I want to tell you the story as we have gone through that with my company, World Sensei. We founded that company back almost 10 years ago now, um, where nobody knew what Internet of Things is. I just came out of Orange, literally founded every single standard you can think of on Internet of Things. And then uh, when they we started the company, we didn't know what to do. We said, let's look at a problem. Let's start with traffic. So we invented the concept of smart parking. Okay? So the idea is you put sensors in each parking spot in the city. And uh, these sensors would allow us uh, to tell us in real time what's your occupancy. Um, we can tell that to you on your smartphone, so we can tell you where to drive or not to drive, but we can also tell the city if there's anybody who hasn't paid or paid uh, or overstayed the time, right? Uh, company actually against all odds is doing really well. It's now a $150 million company. I want an applause. Yeah. It was a really, really rough ride. It was a very rough ride because we were suffering this one here, okay? Um, we started with smart because we thought that's the easiest thing to do. So we went to a company called IBM. Let me just ask, anybody from IBM here? Okay, good news. So IBM is a great company. Now, what I didn't know is that IBM is not only great in the sense of awesome, it's also great in the sense of big. Oh my God, every single meeting we went on a smart city, right? Ten people there and said, we love your concept, right? Come back next week, we're going to introduce you to some more people. <laughs> Come back next week, some more people. So, you know, every time we went into a meeting that did like this, ten people fell out, new people we met. So I probably met every single employee of IBM <laughs> on planet Earth, including the group CEO, okay? Only problem is, I had travel expenses, food expenses, and other schmoozing expenses, and I had zero income, okay? <laughs> Sounds a bell? Yeah? So here you go, because I engage with the city guys, the smart guys. The smart guys have absolutely nothing to do in the value chain in the city. They're not owning this. The other people, and I have a problem, I have to pay 50 people their salaries. They need to go home to feed their families, right? So what do we do? Cash flow problem. We say, you know what? Let's go to the city guys, to those who are actually out there painting the parking lines, putting the machines in place, uh, mounting the bumps in there, right? The ones with the dirty hands, basically. And we went in there, the four founders, into these meetings. Um, <laughs> like you would imagine, you know, uh, four musketeers from Silicon Valley going in there saying, Look, guys, you can employ, you know, Internet of Things, you connect it upstream, you know, to your data center. Uh, it's going to be processed with machine learning, some AI in there, CNNs downstream on the UI, great UIX, you follow me, right? Everything a little bit clarified. And they were looking at us in total bewilderment. And then one of the guys said something which influenced me and my sales cycles for the rest of my life. He said, what the fuck is this? <laughs> right? So we learned a very hard lesson there. Okay? Excuse my French. Is that right, boss? Yeah. I asked him. I gave him the choice, right? So here you go. Uh, so what I learned there is that you really need to undersell when it comes to new stuff. And that's what we did from that moment onwards. We are just underselling something which could do so much more. Just to align the language. That's what we did. And it worked actually uh, really magic, right? So um, that's from that side. Let me go to my next slide. The other problem is that problem here. It's the um, the issue about need versus demand. And um, you know, all of you understand uh, uh, supply versus demand, uh, but this one here isn't that obvious. 
I'll give you 60 seconds to think about it. I'm a university professor, I'll do that all the time with my students. So, <laughs> this is maybe the most important slide you'll see today. Need versus demand. What, what, what is meant here, right? So there's a big difference here. Um, the need is your pain. The demand is the willingness of somebody to pay for the pain. That's very different. Yeah? I'll give you an example from a private life, and you will understand that, and I start with that, right? So, um, my Fitbit um, and my wife, complained that I, you know, gained a bit of weight, not super healthy, okay? So we are in that situation that uh, I know there's a problem, there's a pain somewhere. There's a lot of supply there, loads of gyms, loads of parks in London, I could run, I could exercise, right? Do I do it? No, there's no demand on Misha's side. The reason is because I just don't know how to implement the routine of doing the exercise in my daily life, right? Getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning, I'm going back to bed at 1 o'clock, doesn't fit in there. So I have a need, I have a supply, but I have zero demand. We understand that. It happens to you, right? And uh, in the city, it's exactly the same thing. You give them a new piece of technology, they, they, they probably love it. There's a need, most likely. You can sit down to a business model, work out already how you would use it and all that, but uh, they just don't know how to use it. Because there's nobody there who can use the data, actually, who can act on the data, etc. So that's one of the biggest insights, really. You need to understand there's a huge difference between uh, need and demand. Demand takes time. But demand is like, you know, no matter how good you try, it takes time and a lot of money. I always say demand is a bit like, it's like a wine uh, or a, a poor relationship. It just needs more time, right? So and that becomes really, really good. And that's what you need to do. You just need to relax. New stuff, you know, new stuff you introduce. If your customer doesn't buy it, uh, I presume they're in the room here, yeah, you hurry up a bit and you take a bit more patience and all is going to be good. And we learned it the hard way. We really learned it. And, and actually, the demand was very different in different markets. And when it comes to cities, I learned knocking on everybody's uh, door in the town halls around the world for probably six, seven years is I learned there uh, are three types of cities. There's one city type which is a return of investment driven. Okay? There's another type of city, which is your city here, which is the uh, carbon-driven city uh, or people-driven city, the social-driven city, right? And there's a third one, which is the vanity-driven city, okay? So if you look at it, these are the three types of cities you have today. Return of investment, how much cash can we make out of this, or how much can we save? Um, on the, uh, the people side, how can we help, uh, help people? We had discussion today. And uh, the third one is, you know, how can we really, uh, how can I show off Olympics, some event, etc. And we adapted our sales pitch to every single of these city types. You know, same solution, smart parking, right? Same thing. So I'll take the phone and I'll call, I don't know, call New York, right? Return investment. Hey, Giuliani, how are you, man? Got something really cool for you, right? Oh, yeah. Right, so you deploy that smart city solution, put it on the street, and uh, you know, smart parking, really clever stuff. You'll uh, yep, yeah, you can fire all your traffic wardens. Yep, <laughs> no problem. Yeah, good deal. All right, take care. Right, that was New York. Now, how do we do Europe? Okay. <laughs> Bonjour, Monsieur Sarkozy. Ça va? Vous êtes bien? La France, bon? Ah, les Français, toi, quoi? Oh, bon. Non, mais c'est que c'est français. Ok, I have something for you, which is really great. You will love it, right? So it's a solution, we put it in the streets of Paris, and uh, it will make sure that your people will not like to come with the car in the center, because we can find them every single moment. Yeah, 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 no problem. To fire people? No, 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 no. We're not going to fire anybody. It's going to be perfect. You can hire more traffic ones and you can employ as many people as you want. And it will be very efficient for them. Okay, so, okay, 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 so you jump. All right, that was, that was, get out of it, right? You get it? Same solution, different approach. Now, Manity City. The <laughs> spelling of Putin. <laughs> Все по плану. Да, Россия хорошо. Слушай, у меня есть что-то. Anybody speaks Russian here?
to be. Okay, I, I have something for you. <laughs> right, it's uh, uh, technology. No, 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 no vodka. Technology, right? Yeah. Put in the streets of Moscow and, you know, it will be really visible. And yes, yes, you can put your picture on the iPhone app. And when they open it, you will be the first one to be seen. Yes, yes, it can be shut as no problem. With the tiger? No problem. <laughs> okay, all right. So, that's our event, okay? Do you want to know how Moscow really went? Yeah? Because I mean, Bolton, Kyrgyzism. Actually, the same way. That's exactly how it's going. So, here we go, right? So, we are smart enough. Very smart. Uh, so, we all had probably the first, uh, the world's largest smart cities which on the planet back then. I uh, probably, uh, arguably, still today. Um, and um, it's in Moscow, right? So we got it out, so that wasn't easy, but uh, we actually had the same solution, adopted the sales page for every single city and every single economy. That was a trick, that's it. That's how we got selling, right? And uh, the supply and, uh, sorry, the demand and need uh, is not the only conundrum when it comes to the IT equipment, data, right? So look at data, and that data is part of your business, so let's talk about this for a second, right? Uh, so if you take, uh, Google, and you type in big data. Can we do that? Can you check that, actually? I didn't check it for a while. Big data. How many hits do you get? Right? I think 100 million hits. 100 million hits about big data. Can you check that? 100 million. It's probably more by now. So there's more big data about big data than big data itself. Can you follow me? You still good? Do you more drinks? You get it, right? Does it make sense? 100 million. 40 million at Smart City. 100 million about big data. So. It really kind of, you know, do, do you know Dana Reilly, this American guy in 2010, he coined the term, the definition of big data, uh, he compared it to teenage sex, do you remember that? Yeah? Do you want me to tell that to you? Are you ready for that? So he said big data is like teenage sex. Uh, you know, everybody, uh, everybody talks about it, okay? Yeah? Um, nobody does it, of course, but everybody assumes everybody's doing it, so everybody pretends they're doing it. Yeah. Remember my teenage years, I can say, uh, I will very badly, okay, so here you go. <laughs> that's the, but you know, that's not the worst part of it all, actually. If you look at the who's using the big data, that's really when it gets very bad. Because uh, big data today is being used in PowerPoints, okay? It's all upstream. You get a lot of data being crunched for your engines, ends up in a PowerPoint of a CEO or VP, okay? And uh, that's it. What we're going to do with it then? Who's going to use it? If somebody tells me Waterloo is the busiest station, train station in London at 7 o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday, you know what? You're right. I knew that. You don't need to tell me. I don't need this. I don't need this upstream info. I need downstream action. I need somebody to act on this stuff and really do something with the data. For every big data exercise, you need a big action. Do you understand that? Does it make sense? It's the second thing I want you to remember. I can't remember what the first one was, but that's the second thing. And the third one is we have gravity. Uh, quite a lot of that. <laughs> All right. So it turns out we have a lot of problems in cities. But you know what? We figured out how to solve it. It's the citizen stupid. Right? We need to involve the we've been talking about technology. We have to involve the citizen. They love it. They want to be involved. I'm a hands-on guy. I worked a year in construction. So you know what I did? I went into London in the streets and I started to talk to people, to engage with them. Because that's really what they want, right? So here I am, engaging, and they love it. <laughs> they love it. Look at this. Here. <laughs> the engagement. Solution to it all, right? You know, I've interviewed 400 people, but I've tried to work with 400 people. Three of them stopped. Three grannies, they felt sorry. Actually. <laughs> I've tried it all. With my red shoes, with that, you know, being, I, it, was, it was a great day out. I learned a really hard lesson. It's really difficult to engage people. It's very difficult, right? So, uh, and that's what Sadie has been trying to do all the time. I'm sure they're managing. We're going more crowd, we're listening more to the citizens, etc. And you will not find anybody stopping, by the way, right? So it's just really impossible. Um, 
So uh, the, 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 the thing I learned really is, is you know, Lenin tries to you know, beef up the whole citizen engagement and all that. Uh, truth is that even if you start involving, you know, people from, uh, you know, just 10 people versus 100 people, 1,000 people, you will never ever get the consensus of London as a city. That's a real problem, right? Citizen so engagement is a little cheap because you think you have really captured the end user group in your design process, but you have actually forgotten quite a lot of user groups and they will come out very quickly. What about the kids? What's about, what about the disabled, the elderly, right? It's easy to get somebody on oh, Facebook kind of feedback and, and digital. It's just one very thin layer of society, right? So that's a real problem. Anyway, so I analyzed that data because I had a lot of data now, so I did big data analysis. And actually, you know what? I had a great, a great outcome here. So I plotted this graph. Let me show that to you, right? So that is um, the vehemence of people saying no, or the the walking speed as we were passing by, right? So sound wasn't there, but you've seen them passing by. Some were very slow, and others were like pretty running, okay? So that's the speed here. Um, and here's the time when they started to respond, right? So first thing I realized is that uh, there's a direct correlation between walking speed and the vehemence of people saying no. So people go slow and say no. And people run and say, hey, they're blocked at me, right? The second insight, which is this one here, anybody with big data analysis knows that, is that there is a direct correlation between the timing. So the quicker you go, the quicker you say no, and the slower the more. Now, fasten your seatbelts. There was a type of people in London who would respond before I post the question. <laughs> this is like back to the future. You know, that type of caliber of people is quantum effect. I could like interview thousands of people and finish earlier than how I started. <laughs> Pay attention to that, right? So here you go. Um, anyway, so the citizen engagement, I think we need to, it's an offline topic, quite a big topic. We have solutions for that, how to do that right. It is a good way of doing it, but the way how most cities approach it, most industries, it just doesn't work. Okay. Let me talk about some key trends, and then we're almost there with the whiskey and all that, right? Um, quite a few of them, actually. I, I wrote them down on, oh no, I washed, I washed my hands, so let me try to remember key trends, right? Let me talk about the technology trends first. What is the type of technology which will disrupt you first? Have you thought about this? I can tell you there's one which is a really big black swan coming, and that's quantum technology. Okay, it's quantum technology. It will screw you from all sides. Let me tell you two sides. First side is on the security, because with quantum computer we can do something uh, fairly quickly. What we can't do with normal computers, we can crack ciphers. Okay, so all your payment industry is running currently on our uh, on on security ciphers where we assume we can't find the matching uh, prime numbers. Uh, with quantum computers, we can do that rather quickly, which means overnight your whole system will be down. And you better take it down, right? Big black swan, how do you prepare for that? You ready for that? There's another one. With quantum computing, you can actually do loads of the uh, cryptocurrency calculus much quicker, right? So distributed ledger to Bitcoin mining, those who have quantum computers will be actually having a really big unfair advantage. Escalate the markets and uh, I think it will have a big impact on you guys. So you'll be prepared for that. The quantum age is coming. The computers are up and running, getting there. So prepare for that. The second thing is about the change of identity. And, you know, someone had alluded to that already. And it's a very fascinating uh, transition because uh, if you think about it, 20 years ago, all what mattered was your nationality, right? All that matters today in the digital age is something very different. We transited from an age of passports to an age of passwords, right? If I lose my passport today, I don't care. Uh, part of loads of them, but I just read it. If I lose my password, I freak out. Because in all my identities, I have a problem now, right? I have my corporate identities, all my startup identities, my politics identities, you know, a lot of stuff. If I lose that password, it's, it's, it's really my hand. So therefore that transition of identity will impact how uh, financial conflicts will play out, etc. I'll leave that for you, if I can have it figured out, but you should keep an eye on that. 
The third trend is uh, the trend of co-design, and also that was alluded at, you need to engage much more with your end, uh, end stakeholders, do essentially a lot of these exercises together. And the, the reason really is uh, manifold, but one of them is, and I realized that very quickly, is because once you do the co-design and it goes over many years, um, your end customer stops questioning the cost. And the reason is because they start seeing the value, right? And that is very important, that transition from a, a transactional cost relationship where you just meet a procurement moment to a value relationship where you're building solutions together is probably uh, one of the most fundamental ones we see now at the beginning of the 21st century. And I offer that at King's in my telco ecosystem with the big boys, with the, with the, the Ericsson's and the, uh, you know, the British telecoms, uh, with the national theaters all their neutral ground we can engage for years on innovation before the final product is launched. Because when it comes to procurement, it's too late. Okay? It's too late. What else do we work on? Uh, this uh, very pioneer notion of circular knowledge economy. So the whole idea at currently how our education is streamlined, you go to school, university, you may do startup, you go to corporate, they just go as upstream, right? So what we're looking at now is more a circular educational process. So you may have not only startups, you may have start-ins. Okay, the idea of creating innovation within huge uh, ecosystem like yours. And the examples like British British Gas has done that. They have successfully created start-ins within the company, which then became very successful big products on their own. Don't lose your innovation power, and uh, it's very dangerous to be in a big ecosystem, uh, because in the end you will be booted out. So, uh, and therefore you need to have that kind of capability. What else can I talk about? Um, nothing else which strikes me right now. Data, you need to get it right, but you've heard about a lot about this, so I'll not talk about this. The last thing I, I want to talk about very quickly is a bit your position. And I think I'm really great to talk about this because I have no idea really how you function in the back end except in the front end because I'm using your, your MasterCard, right? So I, I find actually the whole ecosystem very interesting because the end user is different from your customer. Uh, I think there, there are opportunities but they're dangerous because you may end up a bit like Yahoo. Uh, which is trying to be both and couldn't do both properly, right? So that needs to be looked at very, very properly. But the one thing which strikes me is, you know, that that thing here, that's maybe one of the biggest value adds you have, is a piece of real estate in my pocket, which I'm carrying around all the time. The big question is, could we do more with that, okay? People predicted I wouldn't have these. People predict there would be less cash, with uh, credit cards, I have more cash. People predicted there would be less cards with mobile payment and more cards than what's going on. Anyone carrying around this piece of real estate, can we do something with that? Could we make this a small display? I have the technology, it's very flat. I can connect it to a cellular system. 5G, I'll do that for you, right? And suddenly that becomes a gateway uh, to consumers do a lot of interesting things which typically were actually left to the mobile phone, right? So loads of uh, innovative ideas, I think, which could be done. I'd like to leave you with that, but I remember, I think you should remember what you really want to stand for. Um, and I'm going to finish with my last slide because uh, we talk a lot about cities and the one thing I'm working on with Sadi Khan now is about uh, London as a totally new city. Um, that's what I would love to stand for. That's my secret dream for London. So how does square in 2030? When's the last time you heard of the uh, in your city, right? So it's not about less cars, more efficient cars, it's about no cars. And that's what we're looking at how can you transform London as we just we get rid of every single four big four wheel vehicle, including buses and uh, anything else. Just bicycles, people walking. Thank you.